produce Douglas, I always use this opportunity to plug some upcoming library things. Um, we are going to be closed for Thanksgiving and the day after Thanksgiving. Um, but after that, on well, let me get the date now. Right, November 29th. I don't know if you all know, this is Death and Dying Month here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have Death and Dying Month every November yeah, here at the library. <laughs> and we talk about all things Death and Dying related. And we've all, we, um, That's why you're, you were attracted to New Hampshire, where they talk about death right on the license plate. <laughs> exactly. Right. Live yes, or die. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yesterday, we had our advanced directive workshop, and we had a nice wow. group of people who worked on that. Mm -hmm. And then on Thursday, November 29th, we have Saying Goodbye, Memorial Options and Disposal of Remains, the Home Funeral Experience. And I'm bringing my shovel. <laughs> and the, um, the speaker, shovel. Lee Webster, um, is a native Vermonter now living in New Hampshire, is going to um, talk about green funerals mm -hmm. and that kind of good stuff. Um, and on December 1st, <laughs> we've added a um, foundation, another foundation quilting class. Do you want to do quilting? You're making boats and quilting is very similar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's with Sylvia Newberry, and you can sign up for that. And tonight, Ways of Learning, an apprentice boat builder in Japan, is brought to us um, by the generosity of the Vermont Humanities Council. And we're very lucky. They um, let us have two speakers a year for a very nominal fee. Um, and we're grateful for them. And um, part of what we get to do is mention that. And the other thing that the Vermont Humanities Council does is we do their um, reading um, book discussion groups with them and they have um, a bunch of sets that you can pick from and we were starting to run through our sets so we contacted them and said we would like to come up with our own set and it was between a lot of back and forth with Teresa Gregory the assistant director here and Rachel Cohen who does the book discussion they came up with sustainability hope hype and how to and all these books are around that topic and the next book is the town that food Food Saves by Ben Hewitt. Chuck is nodding because I'm sure you've read this. And that discussion is November 28th. And it's not a long book. You could pick it up and read it. And the discussions are really, really wonderful. And then they'll be doing Animal Vegetable Miracle, A Year of Food Life by Barbara King Solver, which some of you may know. And on February 20th, we're doing Another Turn of the Crank by Wendell Berry. And so we're thankful to, for the, again to the Vermont Humanities Council. They, they subsidize quite a bit of that for us, as well as the uh, Friends of the Heartland Public Library helps pay for that. So um, thank you for allowing me to do the sure. library plug, Good Douglas. Yeah. And without further ado, I'm going to give you Douglas Brook. And um, tell me when you want me to turn off the lights now, or you want to give me no, some time? No, no, just give, yeah, I'll give you time. Okay. So thank you for coming. Um, and so I'm going to talk tonight about uh, and show a lot of pictures. I'll go through the pictures rather quickly, but I'm going to talk about my five apprenticeships with different Japanese boat builders. Um, I have been studying with Japanese boat builders. My first apprenticeship was in 1996, and uh, 96, 2001, uh, no, 96, 2000, 2002, 2003, um, and 2009-10. So <clears throat> spread out um, geographically around Japan as well. So I guess we can start to lower some lights. We'll see how that goes. That's, well, that's good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So I'll begin with just the iconic Japanese boat image. Probably you're all familiar with Hokusai's The Wave. And you may have never noticed that there were actually boats in that picture. Um, that's a great wave off Kanagawa. Um, this is a very poor slide. Uh, a student of mine has promised to make me a better slide than this. But obviously, a map of Japan, uh, Hokkaido, which is the furthest north, is, is off there to the upper left. But that dark line, kind of snaking all around the country, those are my major travels around Japan. Um, Japan has 47 prefectures, the way we're divided into 50 states. I've been to 45 of them. And uh, the five apprenticeships um, that I'm going to talk about tonight in order, my first apprenticeship was here on Sato Island in the Sea of Japan. 
My second apprenticeship was in Tokyo Bay, as well as my third apprenticeship, two different boat builders in Tokyo Bay. My fourth apprenticeship was right up here on the Pacific coast on this peninsula, and that's actually the northern edge of the tsunami zone, and I can talk about the tsunami. Uh, the tsunami zone really runs, there's Fukushima, and the damage, Hachinohe was pretty badly damaged, and my village had a, had a little bit of damage. And then my most recent apprenticeship does not show on the map because that's Okinawa, which they had put down there. And Okinawa is actually very far south. Um, I was much closer to Taiwan than I was to mainland Japan when I worked in Okinawa. So um, those are the apprenticeships and the photos just go chronologically uh, from beginning to end. And I'll, I'll also um, say that if you have a question, don't, you know, don't be afraid to interrupt me during the talk, I'm happy to stop, um, and maybe you'll have to remind me where my train of thought was. So we'll get right to it. My first apprenticeship uh, on Sato Island was building these boats. Uh, oh, and we've got some more people coming in. Hi, come on in. Hello. Hi. Have a seat. We just started. Our first real slide. And so these, um, these are called tarai bune, which literally means tub boat. Bune is boat in Japanese, tarai is tub. And these boats are now found only on uh, Sato Island. And they're used for fishing. This man is steadying the boat <laughs> with the paddle. He's looking through a wooden box with a glass bottom. And behind him are a selection of spears for gathering shellfish. Actually, that hooked spear is for abalone, and this, this, this spear is to gather seaweed, but the main catch, this prong spear, is for a little tiny conch shell called <coughs> sazae, which is actually very expensive in Japan, and one of the few Japanese foods I don't like. <laughs> uh, but for fishermen on Sato Island, it's a, it's, it's a good catch. What does it taste like, Douglas? Um, it tastes like a pencil eraser soaked in motor oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ate enough to feel Yeah, it's very chewy, very chewy. Now, this boat, actually, if you were to go to Sato Island right now, the last time I was on Sato, I counted 200 of these boats still being used. That number inevitably has dropped probably, probably less than 100 now. But um, these boats were really quite popular, and part of the reason is Sado, this corner of Sado has this sharp volcanic shoreline. And if you can imagine this scene with some real wave action, because we're in the ocean here, um, a conventional boat could never get close to these rocks without being, you know, shattered on the shore. But the tugboats, very maneuverable, very durable, and they can bounce against the rocks. And the Sado fishermen believe that the very best catch is up close to these rocks. The other really interesting thing about these boats is that these were traditionally used by women. These boats were only introduced about 130 years ago. And at that time, uh, they became popular very quickly because they allowed a fishing family to have a second affordable boat. Well, dad already had a conventional boat, so the only person to go out in these was mom. So very interesting in Japan. Not that women don't you know, work as hard as their farmer husbands in the fields, um, but in fishing, I don't know of any other place in Japan where women actually go to sea. There is gathering, you know, gathering sea urchins at low tide and assisting in their husbands when they bring the catch in. But on Sato, uh, women actually taking to sea in boats, this, this may be unique. And so you, it's essentially Japanese barrel making. Uh, and the real notable feature, and as, as an apprentice, the most difficult part about building these boats is braiding the bamboo hoops. And I, I, bought, I brought with us tonight, I do have a little show and tell here, I brought a bamboo hoop so you can get a close look at it. It's a bit smaller than on a boat. And then I brought this wonderful little Japanese bucket. And if you look at it, it's got that exact same braided hoops. So feel free to take a good look at this stuff when, when we're done. And of course on the island there are tourist tub boats. And these are uh, operated by women in kind of a, what's considered a traditional Sato outfit. And my teacher was actually quite proud of the fact that he built the first glass-bottomed tugboats for this <laughs> tourist company. And you see that school children are looking. Uh, and note, too, that 
the women are paddling from the bow of the boat. So you pull the boat through the water. And here's a, uh, here's a grandmother coming in. Uh, the boats are also oval, not round. A lot of people, even in Japan, assume these are oval. These have a very iconic kind of folk, humorous reputation from throughout Japan. You know, the funny little round boats from Sato Island. Um, and, uh, and this gives you an idea of the clarity of the water. So you can understand how they can fish using a sight glass uh, and pluck shellfish off the bottom. And in one village, just one village, the men use outboard motors to, uh, to um, move their boats. And you notice how he steers. He puts the paddle, he puts the paddle uh, vertical, the blade is vertical, and uh, steers from the front of the boat. Now, my teacher was the last professional builder of tugboats, and I was his only apprentice. I met him on my very first trip to Japan. Uh, I was so taken with who he was and his story and these amazing little boats that uh, I came back on my second and third trip and took interpreters out to the island and just did a series of interviews with him. But I learned in the course of those interviews that, and this is on one of those trips, I learned that that he, he really couldn't articulate his craft in any kind of meaningful way to me. And it dawned on me that really the only way to document the craft, and by this time I felt very strongly that as the last builder of these boats, and never having taught an apprentice, that somebody should try to document this uh, before it was lost. Um, but I, I realized that the only way to really learn and understand this craft was to get inside it as an apprentice. And luckily, um, at the very end, at the 11th hour, I was literally boarding the ferry boat to leave Sato Island. Um, he rushed up to me and said, will you be my apprentice? And so in 1996, I came back and my wife and I lived with him um, while he and I built the tugboat together. These are miso barrels. He was a third generation cooper. These barrels, well, you couldn't put one of these barrels in this room. These barrels are 10 feet tall and uh, about 12 feet in diameter and they're for fermenting soybean paste to turn into miso. Some of these barrels are 100 years old. And my teacher, Fujisan, his grandfather and his father made these barrels. And he actually worked here in this cooperage maintaining these barrels, uh, primarily replacing the bamboo hoops as they <coughs> rotted away. Uh, and here we are in the workshop, classic Japanese carpentry sitting on the floor uh, the workbench often using your feet to hold the material. He's shaping the staves of the side of the boat, the vertical staves which have a curve, and this is the kind of pattern that he used to check those. Okay, so you can hold that up to the wood and it gives you the bevel on the, the proper bevel on the edge and the curvature on the outside of the stave, and then this edge gives you the curvature on the inside of the stave. So another feature of Japanese boat building is there's a tremendous amount of secrecy in the craft. And most boat builders do not create drawings of their boats. But what they use are little patterns that only they know the meaning of. And so again, in my work in Japan, it's about recording all this stuff um, because only one person, namely the boat builder, knows really knows the secrets behind building the boat. And here we are partway through the boat that he and I built. Douglas, do you speak Japanese? Yes, I do speak Japanese. Uh, ironically, another feature of the Japanese apprenticeship is uh, it is basically learning without teaching. All five of my teachers, and this is a very important point, all five of my teachers at the outset of my apprenticeship said the same thing to me. There will be no talking in the boat shop. There will be absolutely no speaking. And this is the context in which one learns crafts in the Japanese tradition. You do not learn with a one-to-one -one back and forth with your instructor, your teacher. You, the apprentice, it is entirely up to you, the apprentice, to observe, concentrate, and be prepared to perform when your teacher asks you to. And it is part of the reason why the Japanese apprenticeships are really quite long and arduous, because it takes time. Now, I came into this as an experienced boat builder. 
and an experienced woodworker. But of course, in the traditional setting, you would come into an apprenticeship knowing nothing. You'd be 14 years old. By the way, the typical boat building apprenticeship in Japan was six years. Um, I, met, I met a national living treasure kite maker in Japan who told me his apprenticeship was 10 years. And pottery, six years, you know, four to, four to six years is, is a typical apprenticeship in Japanese crafts. Um, and actually, for the first two and a half days of my apprenticeship with Mr. Fuji, he had me sit on a stool and watch him. I watched him for eight hours a day, doing exactly, you know, cutting, making these staves. And then, at the midpoint of day three, he jumped up, handed me the plane, pointed to where he was sitting, and he said, Yatte, which means do. And I sat down and began to make staves, and he walked out of the shop. And he was gone for several hours, and I made staves. And he popped back into the shop. My wife told me later she found him sleeping. He took a nap. And he popped back into the shop, and he went through my pile of staves, and he said, OK, OK, no good, OK, OK, no good, no good, OK, OK, no good, OK. And then he pointed to the no good pile, and he said, now stay, fix. And then he walked out of the shop. And that, that, was, that was the teaching environment. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting, especially to a Westerner. It's quite frightening. <laughs> um, again, and now getting into making the bamboo hoops. Um, actually, this is my teacher's splitter. This is what you see in the photograph, this homemade tool right here. You can take a look at it. He made this. You can buy these at hardware stores made of iron, but he made his out of hardwood. Um, uh, and you split the bamboo. We cut down timber bamboo that was between 50 and 60 feet tall. And then we split, we split them into eight strips, and then using the Japanese draw knife, we shaped the strips and then began braiding the hoops. And this is, again, the hardest part of building the tub boats and Japanese cooperage, because you cannot adjust the size of the hoop. It has to be sized perfectly. And then you pound it on the boat using uh, mallets and special wooden punches. And uh, my teacher was really a master of this. Um, so that bamboo is really that durable. Oh yeah, it's very durable, incredibly flexible and very durable. And we, um, he believed that you had to cut, split, shape, and braid the hoops the same day. I've met other barrel makers in Japan that let you see how green the bamboo is. I've, I've met other barrel makers in Japan that, I, you know, I'm sort of an accidental cooper because I studied this, tough, this type of boat. Uh, but others have different theories about letting the bamboo sit for a little while. But it is, oh, it's incredibly strong material. Well, later, I mean, you can try to, you'll get a sense of it when you inspect this hoop. Does it shrink? No, not at all. No, it doesn't shrink at all. Um, bamboo is not a wood, by the way. Bamboo is a grass. So it has a really different mm -hmm. cellular makeup. And that's, sorry, the poor quality of that photograph. These early pictures are all, these are all um, my 35 millimeter slides digitized. So halfway through my apprenticeships, we switched to digital, and the pictures should get better. But that's the boat that my teacher and I built together. And then, uh, actually, I never saw my teacher again. He passed away in 1999. And a foundation on the island uh, got in touch with me and sort of said, uh-oh, uh uh, you were his only apprentice. And what do we do? This is like our iconic uh, boat. And so I proposed that we do both the traditional thing and the modern thing. And I said, I'll teach an apprentice on the island how to build these boats. And that's what I'm doing here. And we will also publish my research on how to build these boats. And so this is my first book. It's in English and Japanese. I am selling it here. And uh, it contains the first measured drawings ever published of tub boats. It's got drawings of the, of the, um, the patterns you need. It's essentially a how-to book. Uh, a competent woodworker should be able to build a tub boat from this book. So um, we've sold over a thousand copies, which I'm quite proud of. Uh, no, I'm sorry, we've sold uh, well over 2,000 copies. I've almost sold a thousand copies in the English-speaking world, and in Japan they've sold over a thousand copies. So um, it's the beginnings of efforts to try to you know, save this craft from disappearing. And here I am in Kingsland Bay on Lake Champlain. 
<laughs> so um, one nice October day with my dog, what better thing to do than to just take your tugboat out for a, a ride. So if you ever see me, I don't want to hear that rub-a-dub-dub -dub joke, <laughs> uh, but I am, I am out there from time to time. Now my second apprenticeship, I, of course after studying with Mr. Fuji, I really yearned to build a quote-unquote conventional boat. And my second apprenticeship was in 2000 in Urayasu, which is the town just east of Tokyo. And this photograph shows the fleet of seaweed gathering boats sailing in from out on the mud flats where they, they grew seaweed, cultivated seaweed, nori, on nets. And they would just pick it off the nets, fill these boats, and then you spread it out like you're making paper and it dries. And that's the seaweed that rat we see in sushi. Those, you know, you buy those rectangles in the store. That's nori. Um, I love to ask people what their best guess is as to the date of these photographs. Remember, this, as the crow flies, this is about six miles from downtown Tokyo. I'm going to show you a couple of historic photos. This is downtown Urayasu. Uh, when I say fishing village, I mean fishing village. You are looking at 1,800 wooden fishing boats wow. packed along. Urayasu didn't have a main street. Urayasu had a main river. And that's the Sakai River. And the previous picture that you see in the background, that's where the Sakai, that's Tokyo Bay in the background. So there's the mouth of the Sakai River. Here's downtown. I think I've got one more historic photo. Yeah, those are the seaweed boats out on Tokyo Bay. Um, and so, any guesses as to when these pictures were taken? I was say not long ago. You were going to say not long ago? Yeah. Okay. 1926. 1926. <laughs> 50s or 60s? 50s or 60s? People are smarter than me. This was 1964. And um, frankly, I think it's pretty amazing. I mean, I don't know where in 1964 you could have gone in the Western world and see, you know, within five miles of a major city and found a concentration of traditional wooden boats like this. But I remember when I first saw this picture, I thought, this has got to be from the dawn of photography, right? <laughs> um, although those are motor boats, those are larger boats or motor boats. So that's one giveaway. So the 1920s is a good guess. Uh, but anyway, very, very good of all of you. Um, well, I got to apprentice in the brand new Urayasu Museum, which you can see there in the background, with Mr. Uragawa, who was the last boat builder of the community. And um, one of the things that came out, he built 300 of these seaweed boats in his career. And he didn't get his first power tool until 1955. Mm -hmm. So he built hundreds of boats entirely by hand. So uh, for the opening of the Urayasu Museum in 2000, he and I built a boat together. Now, Mr. Utagawa had drawings. This is a representation. This is a copy I made of his boat drawing. The only problem with this drawing is you can't build a boat from it. If you're familiar with, uh, if you're familiar with uh, you know, boat naval architecture, you can see here the profile of the boat. So there's the bow of the boat, the top edge, which we call the shear line, the bottom of the boat. There's the transom. And then this line down here, this is a half view of the bottom of the boat, the, the keel plank, right? So you've got those two views. But what you don't have is you don't know the width of the boat along this chine and along the shear. So it's impossible to build a boat from this drawing. And I also brought today uh, Japanese boat builders draw their boats on planks of wood called itazu, plank drawing. They feel that paper is too impermanent. But um, this is Mr. Utagawa's boat drawing for one of his larger motor boats, power boats, and he gave it to me. And it, too, is full of all the missing information. And the missing information is all memorized by the boat builder. Yes, uh, as a way to protect their secrets. What kind of wood do they have there? Uh, cedar, Japan. primarily cedar, sugi, Japanese cedar. What's comparable to American? Uh, it's a lot, you know, density-wise, it's like northern, well, it's a little denser than northern white cedar. You know, it's a cedar, it's in the same family, the same general family. Yeah, this is, you can look at this, this is a piece of, piece of it. So, 
Um, so anyway, my teacher, one of the one of the, my jobs, trying to apprentice with him and document, you know, his work was to get all these secret dimensions, get all the secret ratios, and record it. And uh, this image is actually of my full, not full size, but my, you know, architecture size drawings of the boats. And I produce these, and I do them bilingual. The text is in Japanese and English. And this is our boat. So a little bit about Japanese boat building. They're, they're built essentially on the floor. They're built right side up. We often, in the West, we build boats upside down and right side up. Uh, and uh, very few clamps are used. The, the shop itself is a tool. And you see all the props being used to hold all the pieces of the boat together. And this gets really wild <laughs> as, you, as you, the boat building progresses. It's fun to just look at all the props, and there's even props against props. And we're starting to plank. Uh, I'd like to show this picture. Uh, that's a brand new chisel on the bottom and two of Mr. Utagawa's chisels <laughs> above. And I'd like to um, show this picture and say, you know, if this isn't an example of a lifetime of hard work, having literally sharpened away that much steel over a lifetime of building boats. And here's our boat coming together. Uh, another feature of Japanese boat building versus Western boat building, we, like, like clapboards on a house, we fasten through our planks into frames or ribs. In Japanese boat building, there's very few, if any, ribs in the boat. The planks are edge fastened to each other. And these little notches you see are little shallow mortises, and there's a curved nail traveling down and fastening that top and bottom plank together. And if that sounds hard, that is hard. And I brought a couple of tools. I brought some Japanese boat nails. And I brought some of the special chisels used to cut those holes. Because you don't drill those holes. You cut them with special chisels, including a curved chisel. So you can get that the proper curve of, uh, of that hole. And uh, this is our launching ceremony, which was Shinto-based. All ceremonies around boat building in Japan are Shinto-based. Um, that's a whole slideshow in itself. It's you know really quite rich in in culture and tradition. Excuse me, are those the nails you mentioned? Are they iron nails? Or yeah, they're iron nails, and they're flat. They're made of flat steel. They're not wire nails. Again, you can take a look at these. Are they protected from out? And yeah, these are galvanized, but in the old days they weren't galvanized. Um, and so again, back to you know my documentation work. So all those dimensions you see there would would normally have been memorized by my teacher, and my job is to basically write them down. Um, there's a well-known phrase in in Japanese apprenticeship called nusumi geiko, which nusumu is the verb to steal. Geiko means lesson, stolen lessons. And in the traditional apprenticeship. Unless your master was a family member, your father or an uncle, and you were coming into the family business, the, the master didn't actually teach the apprentice everything. And the apprentice was expected to steal the most important secrets from his master. And uh, one of my teachers did apprentice with his father, but all my other teachers, my other four teachers, did not. Although my fifth teacher was essentially self-taught. So three of my teachers literally lived through that process stealing lessons from their master. And they told me stories about sneaking back into the shop at night to study the layout. And telling me how when they would lay out the dimension, when the teacher would lay out the dimensions of the boat, the master would send them to the other end of the shop so they couldn't see it. So very, very interesting, um, really interesting conflict between master and apprentice. Uh, again, some of my detail work, just the details of nailing. Uh, the fastening of the top plank, which is the vertical plank, to the bottom plank. Again, these are just uh, some of my documentation work. Uh, that curved chisel, uh, this is my Tokyo teacher. In this picture, he's drawing me. Um, you see B-29. Um, he's describing the firebombing of Tokyo when he was a young boy. And um, his father's boat shop and their house went up in flames um, that night. Uh, I believe 100,000 people in Tokyo were killed in that firebombing raid, and 
his father, he told me that his father said, just grab the tools. And he, they loaded wheelbarrows and they escaped the fire bombing. And these are those boat nails. These are boat nails, Japanese boat nails. A slight curve to them and galvanized, the head offset to one side, and they're made of flat steel stock. And there's my teacher and I. We have planks up on edge, and we are using these chisels to make the pilot holes. And there, this gives you an idea. So that nail eventually will go into this tapered mortise. The head will fetch up here, and the shaft of the nail will come through here, right in the center of the plank, <coughs> and go into the, you, the adjacent you drill plank. drill that shaft, and then? That's cut with a chisel. That's cut with these, these chisels. No drills. Are you, are you doing some measuring? Yes. Okay. Yeah, measuring. Well, you see the layout lines. Right. Guiding. So you're not, it's not all templates? It's, or? it's not all intuitive or nor, okay. nor templates. Yeah, we're measuring, yeah. And there's a cutaway. So there you see the two planks, clearly. The grain <coughs> separates the two planks, and that nail driven in to hold them together. And uh, next, the, the next really interesting feature of Japanese <coughs> boat building is Japanese boats are built with no, without any caulking. We in the West, we use and traditionally use cotton caulking. We drive it into the plank seams to make the hull watertight. The Japanese do no such thing. They set the material up on the shop floor, <coughs> <laughs> put the planks together, clamp them together, or prop them together, and run a series of saw cuts down the seam. This is prior to nailing. Run a series of saw cuts down the seam to relieve the edges equally on either side of the seam and eventually create a watertight fit. <coughs> and uh, you see this, our two planks laid out there, and we have been working on those seams on the shop floor running the saws up and down this, these seams. And this is days of work. This is days of work. I mean, when my teacher, when I was in the training phase here, I mean, that seam there, maybe <coughs> 14 feet, I would spend most of a day on it. And my teacher, this is my Tokyo teacher, and I should point out the Vermont-based Freeman Foundation sent me to Japan. I lived in Japan for a year for my third and fourth apprenticeships, and that was all funded by the Freeman Foundation. Uh, but this was the Freeman Foundation project in Tokyo, and uh, my teacher believed we, we used three different kinds of saws, each with a finer set of teeth, and with each saw, I spent a couple of hours on the scene. So a very, very painstaking process. No planes? Well, no, no planing at all. and. This is the result. The seam between those two planks is right at the apex of the square. So when these planks are finished and nailed together, you almost cannot, in some, in some cases, you can't see the seam. And another feature of Asian boat building, not just Japan, in the West, we steam wood when we bend it. We put it in a steam box. In Japan, they bend over an open fire. They bend planking over an open fire. Quite an adventure. <laughs> and uh, you'll notice downtown Tokyo behind us. Um, this was really quite something. My teacher and I, we were literally working uh, on a main street in downtown Tokyo. Uh, we got a lot of uh, a lot of sidewalk visitors. And here are some of his patterns, which he labeled for my benefit. Um, there he is, that's a planking bevel, he's checking the planking bevel. Uh, another very interesting technique used throughout Japan to set an angle. To set an angle, you take a stick with a boat nail as a plumb bob and a string. That line is one shaku. That's the traditional Japanese foot. I'll talk about that in a moment. The shaku, one shaku. You lay your plank against your plank angle, and your angle is the horizontal measurement from the one shaku point out to the string. So to, to remember the angle, the proper angle of a plank on a boat, the Japanese boat builder remembers that dimension. They don't, they don't work in degrees or you know, any other way like that. And, uh, and, and so I'll talk about the measuring system. 
The metric system is universal throughout Japan. It's actually legally mandated. It's actually technically illegal, technically illegal, to have a tool like that that's not metric. That tool is not metric. That is shaku. And the shaku, there's a schematic of that, that tool. So the number he remembers was 0.775. Um, anyway, the, um, the shaku is a decimal system. Uh, each shaku is divided into 10 sun, each sun into 10 bu, shaku sun bu, and it is great for Westerners like me because one shaku is 11 and 15 16 inches. <laughs> so when I'm in Japan and some crusty old fisherman, I say, how long is your boat? And he says, 24 shaku. It's like, yeah, just under 24 feet. Um, so it's really great. I don't know about you, but I can, metric means nothing to me. You know, I have no background with metric. And in Japan, traditional house carpenters, out in the countryside, traditional house carpenters still work in shaku. Boat builders, all traditional boat builders in Japan work in shaku. And kimono makers work in shaku. And the tatami mat has never gone metric. The tatami mat is shaku as well. So yeah, kind of interesting how that's held up. Uh, here's our boat going together. You see the charring uh, on the inside of the planking where we bent it. It was the apprentice's job later to plane that all clean. Just some shots going through here. A historic shot. This is my this is my teacher at age ten at the launching, and this man in the bowler hat is a necktie is his father. And this is a wooden cargo ship that yeah. he built. He was a, a boat builder. My my Tokyo teacher was a fourth generation boat builder. And and his bailer. And if you want an appreciation for the quality of craftsmanship, that's all I have to show you. Absolutely beautiful. Just beautiful. And a beautiful piece of mortise and tenon workmanship. And that's our boat. That's our boat on launch day. Um, the little squares, you see little rectangles, these are copper, plate copper covers for every nail head. Um, Copper, and this was copper covering the seam at the bow, and copper, and it was, you know, it was put on as a protective, uh, protective method. Uh, you generally saw that in urban centers because it was so expensive. Out in the countryside, it was too expensive for boat builders to use that. And that boat, if you go to Tokyo, get in touch with me because that boat was give, given by the Freeman Foundation to a nonprofit that teaches traditional rowing in a canal in Tokyo. And that's the traditional Japanese sculling oar uh, that they're using. Uh, and that boat is named for Doreen Freeman. That, that boat's named Doreen. Uh, this is just another view of a multi-oared uh, sculling oar boat. You see the same exact sculling oar there. That's a single. That's typically the way they're found. But in special boats, this is actually a traditional Japanese whale boat the kind of boat that would go chase whales with a harpooner. Um, and so eight of those sculling oars. Now, my fourth apprenticeship up in the, uh, the northern edge of the tsunami zone. Uh, this boat builder did not use drawings. So he had no drawings whatsoever. He worked entirely from memory. And we were building a sea boat. That's a look at the stem, uh, the, the, the keel to stem joint connection. It's called a bite scarf, and there's a wedge there in the middle holding it together. And he had a series of patterns. That's a pattern. You see the faded labeling on it, a pattern for the angle of the bottom plank. Bending the planks. Um, this time we used charcoal. And then here we are fitting the plank to the boat. And so these planks went on in one piece. These, was, these weren't built up out of several pieces of wood. But notice the props. This is entirely propped onto the boat. Just sticks from overhead and below and from the side. And he's doing the saw relief between the keel and plank. And that was a solid day's work for the two of us. There we both are fitting. And once it fit, we nailed it on. You can see the nail heads. There they are fastened. And in northern Japan, you see the use of big 
naturally grown crook frames in the boats in Hokkaido and northern Japan. And a lot of carving. Uh, interestingly, my teacher made, was, was explicit about this, that I could not do any of the carving. The carving, he said, was his signature. And so only he could do it. And these had, um, these, these carved motifs had great meaning for him and great meaning locally. Although, as apprentice, uh, I was told to paint them. <laughs> Here, uh, my teacher earlier in his career had made a bunch of these squid boats. He'd made about 15 of these squid boats. And this was one of his old squid boats. Here's some of the carving. And then I'm painting it. So we put these, we carved these boards and then we planted them on the boat. This was kind of interesting. I had asked him several times, I said, do you sign your boats in any way? Because some of my teachers and other boat builders, they have some kind of, they don't sign with their name. They'll carve a little geometric figure or something like that. And he said, no, 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 I don't sign anything. I don't sign anything. And we're just about to plant those carved panels on. And um, he got out his, his paintbrush. And what that says, that says Douglas Brooks and Cezo, Cezo Ando and Douglas Brooks from America and his address and all this stuff. He, he, put, this, he put this all on the boat and then he put the plank over it. And he turned to me and he said, that's our secret. Nobody knows about it. What's under there? Now it's all of our secret. So that was kind of an odd, odd little function there. But it's very interesting because this is launch day. And we didn't bring a priest in. We did just he and I, just the two of us. He didn't invite his wife. He didn't tell me to go get my wife. We just He said, hey, we're going to do the ceremony. Um, so with a bottle of sake and a little rice and a couple of candles, we blessed the boat. Um, it's interesting. When I went back over my notes, now, this is a fishing boat. This is just a workaday fishing boat that he spent his lifetime building. One fifth of the total labor in this boat was carving, it was painted carving. And it really stunned me to think about that in retrospect. But he told me, he told me several times through the process, it would be unconscionable to send a fisherman to sea without these carvings on the boat because those were the things protecting the fishermen. Those, those things did protect the fish. I'm sure he believed more in those carvings than he did in a life jacket. And that's our boat. Uh, the Freeman Foundation donated this to a maritime museum in northern Japan. And you can see some of the museum ships in the background. And now off to Okinawa for my most recent apprenticeship, which was two years ago. Uh, Okinawa is a totally different culture than mainland Japan. I had no appreciation for that till I went there. Um, there are only three men left in all of Okinawa who can build the traditional Okinawan boat called the Sabani. And uh, this is the little tiny island I was on. That's, that's the main island of Okinawa in the background. Yejima here is um, about, about two and a half miles wide and about four miles long. And I'm up on this mountain, this very prominent mountain in the center of the island. And these are the Sabani. And very interesting to me, you know, in the Western world, traditional boat building has largely been saved by amateur boat builders. Amateur boat builders who had the means to build traditional boats because certain visionary curators and researchers, you know, recorded our traditions of, of, uh, of wooden boats. And in Japan, the Sabani has been discovered by athletes who uh, annually race, paddle, and sail these boats. But these were, these were fishing boats. My teacher, he built about 100 of these boats after World War II, and then he switched to a more conventional Japanese-style boat, and then he switched to fiberglass in his career. And he told me when the Sabani racing started 10 years ago, you know, these racing teams, they hunted out these three remaining boat builders. They're all in their 80s now. My teacher was 80 one when I worked with him. He's now 83. And he said to me, he said, yeah, he said, I had built those boats entirely from memory. And when these racing, these young people came back to me wanting these boats, I realized I better write those dimensions down. And so this is the only example I've seen of this. He made a crude sketch of his boats and he recorded all of his secret dimensions. So that's a remarkable document. So 
Uh, the amazing thing about these boats is they are largely carved. You are looking at a pair of cedar planks that are two inches thick, over 24 inches wide, and 26 feet long. Those are our side planks. And he's putting his bevel, beveling the plank. Uh, that's the tool he built his first hundred boats with that adds and a few assorted planes. He didn't get power tools till 1965. And oh, it's a little hard to see this, but if you look closely, but these two inch planks we have carved out. Yeah. We've left them full thickness at the gunnel, then we've carved them to half their depth, then we've left them full thickness on this ridge to take the seats, the floorboards basically, yeah. then carved them out and then left them full thickness where they're going to connect to the bottom. So these have been hollowed out. And then we set them up and began a long, a three-day process of soaking them with hot water and slowly bending them with turnbuckles. And we're building this upside down. The Okinawan method is upside down. And then we drop this gigantic timber on the bottom. It is the bottom. And we start carving that. There's from under the boat. And we take it off the boat and begin the slow process of shaping the bottom timber. It's back on the boat. We had to use a chain fall to take it on and off the boat. My teacher is scribing the shape and then fitting it. It's actually comprised of three timbers. There's the bottom almost finished to the left. And there are the sides waiting to receive the bottom. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to study Okinawan boat building was for this. These boats are not fastened with any iron nails whatsoever. They are fastened entirely with these dovetail keys. And I've brought you one all the way from Okinawa. You can take a look at it later. It's made of a tropical hardwood. And here's the sequence. So you see the seam between the plank, planks. You lay out the dovetail key and trace its shape. You drill about half the depth of the plank just to get most of the wood out. And then you start carving. And here's the secret. I'm going to teach you guys the secret. It's easy to get the secrets out of me. It's not easy to get them out of these guys. Can you see the pencil line? Yeah. So you carve to the pencil line at the four corners. But as you carve into the waist of the, the middle of the key, you go a little inside. It takes a bit to imagine this. When you fit that key in, that essentially creates four wedges that suck the planks together. That little leftover amount of wood that's squeezed against the key, and it pulls the two planks into each other. You want a loose fit on the ends because you, that will that'll just keep the planks apart. You want a loose fit on the ends, but if the secret of these is leaving that little wedge shape inside the pencil line. So you fit the ends, you make sure they're nice and loose, you soak it in mom's soybean oil, that's actually tempura oil from the kitchen, you pound it in, and then you plane it you plane it flush. And there they are. And so the boat was fastened. All the seams of the boat were fastened with a set of keys, each one shaku apart, one foot apart. And on the inside of the boat, right centered in the middle, is a corresponding set of keys, one shaku apart. So it's, fa it's got these keys from inside and outside. So with the boat still upside down, there I, am on the, there I am on the outside carving the mortises. So the keys are offset, the, front, the ones on top are one shaku apart, and then the ones on the un, un, underside are like start in the middle? Yes, and, so they're, and like, they're one shaku inches. apart, yeah. So there, there I am carving mortises. You see the keys waiting for me up on top of the boat. Back to the bottom of the boat. 
you'll, you'll see in a moment. So you see the keys? <laughs> we've oiled, we've sanded and shaped, finished the shaping. That's the boat upside down. And you see the keys. And then we put it in slings. And we rolled it over faster than I just showed you in those slides. And then I went to work on the inside. So the bottom goes down? <coughs> yes, the bottom is hollowed as well. Yeah, the so bottom that is hollowed. gives you that area. Yeah. Yep. So you see the keys on the inside. And there's there you see my mortises on the left side, and you see the keys have been pounded in and waiting to be trimmed off on the on the starboard side. So that's why the bottom plank is so thick. Yeah. It's hollowed out. Yeah, you're yeah, that like bottom a big dugout. Yeah, it's a, it's a semi dugout. We would call that a semi dugout. And there's actually throughout Japan, that's a very standard evolution in boats: the dugout, the hollowed out log, to what's called a semi dugout. Did this in the Chesapeake Bay, where you have a carved bottom that you put planks on, and then the evolution is to a entirely plank built boat. Same thing in Japan. And what's amazing is how much you can still find it in Japan. So, what was the purpose of the carving at, uh, on those two planks? Well, well, you're reducing, you don't need all that material. So you're reducing, you know, so you have why to remember. Start with that? Why start with that? It's easier. We have to remember, this is a tradition as a part of an evolution. These were originally carved out of a single log. Yeah. These boats look just like this, carved out of a single log. The, so to ask that question to my teacher, why, did, why don't you just get a plank the right thing? He'd say, no, you just can't do it that way. That's just the way it is. Yeah, that's the way it is. That's yeah. exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. And, that, and I should say, in all my research in Japan, you know, it's a very delicate relationship with every teacher um, because it does require some talking and it does require some questions, though I usually ask those questions at break time. I mean, yeah. When I do this, I wait till break and lunch to ask questions. But it's that my teachers are all so hidebound, so parochial in their own tradition that to ask the why question is always to be told because that's how I do it. You know, there's no, Almost there's no larger, so. there's no larger perspective. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. so, yeah. You know, very, to Westerners, that's a very sort of foreign, we're always wanting to know why, you know. Um, sure, yeah. A bit about you cannot, just as you can't go to Hiroshima, Japan without, you know, confronting the legacy of the atom bomb, you can't go to Okinawa uh, and not, not confront the legacy of World War II. This is Iejima, and here is that, I, that, that rock, that mountain. I took that first photograph of the island. Oh. These are P-47 Thunderbolts. These are U.S. Air Force uh, uh, fighter planes, and uh, Iejima was one of the bloodiest battles of Okinawa. My teacher lost his two oldest brothers in the battle, um, three quarters of the island's civilian population was killed in the battle for Iejima. And Iejima was wanted, was taken, and was fought for so fiercely because there was an airfield on it. And the Americans wanted that airfield. Uh, I show you this picture because these are Air Force drop tanks. So these are filled with gasoline. These were invented during World War II. When you got in a dogfight, you could just drop them to, to get rid of the weight and be more maneuverable. Okay? Well, the Okinawans didn't miss trick. Of course, these fell from the sky by the thousands uh, during the battle for Okinawa. Mm -hmm. They turned them into boats. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in the local museum in Iejima. And I told you the name, the word for boat is bune. These are called tanko bune, tank boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would get these Air Force drop tanks and cut them open and turn them into boats. And I was in my guest house uh, one night and the deputy mayor came by. You know, I, I was the the only foreigner on the island and the only English speaker on the island. And he came by all excited. We got talking about Tanko Bune. And he said, you want to go meet a guy who still goes out, still fishes in a Tanko Bune? And I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, come on with me. And we met this guy, 93 years old. And when we came into his house, he, uh, we started talking to him. He looked at me and he said, the mayor's lying to you. I haven't been out in my Tanko Bune since I was 91. <laughs> but that was he and his wife, and we had a wonderful, we had a wonderful evening chatting about the old days. Back to our boat. That's a shot at the bow. That's really nice. 
Yeah, the uh, dovetail keys and the yeah. pegs. And these are just some final shots of the boat. These are sailing boats, so there's the beam that takes the mast. And my teacher and I just sort of getting the finishing touches. And his bail. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is carved from a single block yeah. of pine, hard pine. And I like to tell people, if a Zippo lighter can be in the Museum of Modern Art, <laughs> There's no reason that can't be in the Museum of Modern Art. And he told me a lot about this. This was also sort of similar to the carving on my pre the previous teacher's book. He said, only I do this. This is my signature. You don't get to touch this. And um, the bottom of this is curved. And he said, it, it perfectly fits the curve the we've the built into the boat. Because these boats are notoriously difficult to sail. They tip over. It's incredible that men went to sea in these things and made a living fishing. They are incredibly difficult to sail. And, um, and he told me, he said, you, you, know why, uh, you know why there's almost nobody left who knows how to make these the old fashioned way? He said, because after World War II, the fishermen discovered that your US Army helmets made perfect bailers. <laughs> and of course, there were thousands of those laying around. So um, this is a really nearly dead art to make those. And here's our launching ceremony. Uh, Okinawan religion, the Okinawans traditionally do not practice either Shintoism or Buddhism. They uh, practice a shamanic religion that is led entirely by women. And the, le the, the absolute highest level is called a Noro. And she's not a Noro. She was like 97 years old, lived on the island. Um, she was a Yuta. And a Yuta is like second level underneath. So we didn't have a Noro available, but we had our we had our shaman nevertheless, and she blessed our boat. Are we looking at the bow or the stern? That's the bow. That's the bow. And you see the stern rises way up. A lot of people have theorized that the Sabani is based on the shape of a fish. Simple as that. Um, and then back to the races. Here's a Sabani on its way to tipping over <laughs> in one of the Sabani races. I, a, a number, they actually have two classes of Sabani races because some people just cannot keep the boats from tipping over and they put outriggers on them. Traditionally, the outrigger was never used in Okinawa. And one of the leading, one of the most experienced Sabani sailors who's actually begun sailing from island to island in, in Okinawa, um, he told me, he told me, I don't think we know one-tenth of what the traditional fishermen knew. My teacher told me a very interesting story because tipping over the boats was a technique. Uh, Okinawan fishermen would ride out a storm by tipping their boat over and hanging onto the gunnel upside down and keeping their heads in the air pocket. And the most remarkable story I heard was my teacher said that his father was out fishing alone in his 26-foot Savani and he caught a 14-foot shark. And he brought it alongside the boat and he killed it but he couldn't haul it into the boat. He couldn't haul it into the boat, he couldn't haul it into the boat, and he had to get back, and he didn't want to lose this, this 14-foot shark. And he finally decided, he thought about it, and he tipped the boat over under the shark. Boat came up under the shark, he jumped in and bailed it out <laughs> and sailed home. Yeah. So here's a, there's an annual Sabani race, it's a 35-mile open ocean race. And this is last year. This is a photograph from last year's race. It's every July. And uh, that's my last uh, picture uh, of the Sabani. Um, we are probably, oh, I'm exactly one hour. Um, we can open it up to questions. I'm, I'm going to show you a few uh, more pictures just because the wow factor. Um, this is a boat builder. I like to, sh I like to introduce this guy. Uh, the wooden vase in front of him and the, um, the valise, he made both of them. And, you know, I can't say enough for the level of craftsmanship that emerges from the end of something like a six-year apprenticeship. And this guy is a perfect example of that. I mean, he made fishing boats all his life, but he could also do this. Uh, it's really quite incomparable, and I must say to all of you, if you go to Japan, get in touch with me, because I'll give you all kinds of ideas, places to go. 
But Japan is an unbelievable inspiration for a woodworker. The temples, the houses, the shoji screens, just everything right down to the little bamboo ladle at the shrine. But this man's claim to fame is he's the only builder of these. He's Japan's only replica shipbuilder. He told me this was his life's work to study and, re and basically rediscover all the secrets of the Japanese cargo sailing boat. And he's built four of these. There's historic picture. That's a load of rice with a tarped over. Oh yeah. <laughs> These were called Sengoku Bune. Sen means a thousand. Koku is a unit of measurement. Bune is ship. A koku as a unit of measurement was the amount of rice needed to feed one man for one year. Mm. We would think of it as a barrel. So this was a thousand barrel ship, Sengkoku. Yeah. A um, couple of interesting things. The traditional Japanese sail is a vertical panel. And it's loosely, see daylight through there? Sure. It's loosely woven. It's self-reefing. So when the wind picks up, oh, yeah. it automatically opens and spills the extra air. Oh. So what's the beam of a boat like that? That, that boat's 100 feet long, and I'd say the beam is around 30 feet. This is his most recent boat. I happened to be in uh, northern Japan just a few weeks before launching. That's below deck. That's sea trials. They're towing the tugboat. I like that. <laughs> the tugboat just wasn't willing to let go of them for safety. That ship, that's the only one that's operational of the four. Close up of the sails. There's a look at a river boat, and you, so you very clearly see how the sail panels work. And this shot, I'll show you. This is his first ship in his hometown, Ofunato. And this was literally ground zero for the tsunami. There were 53 boats in this harbor, and the wave that came through was 35 feet tall. And this ship and two other boats were the only two that survived. And this ship has become something of a symbol in that region of, you know, salvation or fortitude or survival. So this ship was at its mooring and survived uh, the tsunami last year. Uh, this was another boat builder in the tsunami zone. He passed away in the refugee camp. He lost his house and shop. I'd like to show his picture. He was an absolutely remarkable man. He built these boats. He built all of these boats. The tsunami zone for me, the tragedy, well, one of the, tra the obvious tragedy of the tsunami was the um, loss of life. 90% of the boats were destroyed in the tsunami zone, 90%. This region was an absolute mecca of wooden boats. I've traveled four times through the tsunami zone before the disaster, and it was I've never seen such a concentration of traditional wooden boats in Japan. And they're all, well, 90% of them presumably are gone. Um, I, I shouldn't take the time to, those are his patterns. Those are the only, the only record he kept of his boats. And I wanted, this is, his name is Iwabuchi, was Iwabuchi. Working alone over the course of 65 years, I believe his career was 65 years, he built 575 of these boats. That is a boat launching every three and a half weeks for 60 years. <laughs> so, I like to tell that anecdote simply to say, you know, this is a level of craft and a commitment to craft and a culture of craft. I, I really have to say none of us can really even imagine. But it, this is, can still be found in Japan. I mean, these guys are obviously, you know, uh, uh, the youngest Japanese boat builder I know now is, is in his late 70s. So Douglas, what, what, what is a typical work day and work week like? 
for these guys yeah. in their era. Uh, well, through the through the you know in their era, like post war, the blue collar worker took two days off a month, the first and the fifteenth. And interestingly, today in Japan, you see a, a, a remnants of that. The public baths are always closed on the first and the fifteenth. Okay, my teacher in Okinawa. When I got to Okinawa, I, I was there. I was there two and a half months, and the first day on the job, he looked at me and he said, "We work seven days a week." He said, "That's how I work. I've always worked seven days a week. So good, let's go." And that's what we did. We worked seven days a week, and we built that sabani in 54 days. And when when we were done, he looked at me and he said, "He said uh, you're probably proud of yourself." I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> and he said, remember I showed you that ad? Remember I told you how I built 100 Sabani with just hand tools? He said, I used to build them in 40 days by myself with hand tools. You know, you saw me with the power plane and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, and I interviewed a boat builder in Kyushu, and I said, what was your work pattern like? You know, and he said, well, I took two days off. And I said, yeah, 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 you took two days off. You took the first and the 15th. And he looked at me and said, no, I took New Year's Day and the day after. Those are the only, no, I'm sorry, he took New Year's Day and Oban, which is the Festival of the Dead. That's in August. He took two days off a year. I mean, this, this, is, this is also the modern Japanese history. I mean, in 1945, the end of World War II, you want to talk about that Vietnam phrase, bomb them back into the Stone Age. I mean, Japan was utterly destroyed utterly destroyed, you know? And the irony is, you might actually ask, watching my slideshow, how come there are even that many traditional boat builders left in Japan? I mean, we don't have, in this country, a tradition of men or craftsmen with this kind of depth alive, because World War II killed wooden boat building in America. We were the winners, and out of the war came fiberglass, epoxy, plywood, aluminum, right? And, and destroyed wooden boat building. And in Japan, what World War II did, it forced at least one more generation to live in that totally traditional way. You know, I mean, a guy who didn't get power till 1965, right? right? So it's fascinating that, that, you know, that the, you know, and the ultimate irony is we think of, what do we think of as the most modern country in the world? Japan, yeah. bullet trains and you know, everything else. But, but side by side with that, this incredibly traditional way of life that, that lived on at least until recently. This is the youngest Japanese boat builder I know. He's in his late 70s. He's also in the tsunami zone. He's the only boat builder still active in the tsunami zone. And he builds these boats. And I'm trying to raise money right now. I've been in touch with him. And he's gotten a flurry of orders since the tsunami. <laughs> But he's told me, I'm going to finish this group of orders of boats, and then I'm done. I'm over. It's over. And I, I'm trying to raise funds to go back and at least document his boats and Iwabuchi's boats. Uh, because the tsunami is going to just bring in fiberglass boats, right? This whole rich tradition has been wiped out, and it's not going to come back. So, uh, so I'm in the fundraising kick again. Anyway, lovely boats, by the way. They're very simple, but I really think they're elegant. And so that is my very, very last slide. I started with an image of Mount Fuji, and I'll end with one. So we'll take some questions. I've got business cards. I've got my furniture flyers. If you like Japanese furniture, look at the tools and things. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming in. Start the clapping. Start the clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? I hope I didn't drag on too long. A, did he have a leap order or something? Or the Savani? Yeah. No, they don't have a they don't have a leap order so deck the, rudder. The, they don't even have a rudder. It's just so narrow that it. They they they, they, they steer it with a, with an oar. They steer. Yeah, they steer with a paddle. Wow. Steer with a paddle. But there's yeah. no. Okay, so, it's, but it's so narrow that it's tracked enough. They do track pretty well. Yeah. And they have a very Chinese kind of rig. I don't know if you noticed that picture. Yeah. It has the fully battened. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they can rig that by yeah. dropping that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. I have one in the 
How did you get started doing that? Um, well, I didn't bring that up. Um, I um, uh, let's see. When I was in college, I did my I call it my junior year abroad. I went to Trinity College in Hartford, and I spent my junior year at the <coughs> University of Oregon. And my roommate was Nobu Hayashi from Hiroshima, and we became very very good friends. And post college. I got into boat building, and I wound up as the museum boat builder at the Maritime Museum of San Francisco. And I was there from 1985 till 1990. And through, through the 80s, Nobu kept begging me to come visit him in Japan. He so badly wanted me to come to Japan. And I really didn't have any interest in Japan. And in 1990, I left the Maritime, my Maritime Museum job. I wrote him a letter. Those were the days when he had letters. I said, well, I quit my job, Nobu. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And he mailed me a plane ticket wow. with a note that said, now you have no excuses. <laughs> and I bought a Lonely Planet travel guide and a rail pass and a youth hostel membership and put a backpack on. And I went to Japan. <coughs> and I was just traveling around and traveling around. And I thought, you know, there's one thing I never get tired of looking at, and that's boats. And most people who go to Japan, I think this is a great tragedy, they tend to just do the cities. They tend to just, you know, Tokyo, Kyoto, Hiroshima, and gone, right? And Japan has just the most beautiful countryside. And rural Japan is just so earthy and so interesting and just full of culture and festivals and traditions. And it's just amazing. And I was so glad I went off the beaten path, the coastline, and I stumbled upon those tugboats on Sato Island. Yeah. That first shot I took of all those tugboats lined up on the wharf, I took that photograph my very first morning on Sato Island, and I just said to myself, this can't be real. And you know, then people came down and started to go fishing. And then I just thought, well, I'll ask, does anybody build these things? Because some of them look new. And that got me going. I met Mr. Fuji. And as I began to learn about the situation, I'm the sole apprentice for all five of my teachers. You know, as I began to learn that situation, and as a budding craftsman myself, it was just so plaintive to think that all this knowledge was going to be lost. Um, that, you know, I just, I just got irresistibly hooked by this notion of trying to document the craft. So I'm currently finishing my third book on Japanese boat building. And take a card and stay in touch email me, send, and I'll put you on a list, or you can even write your name down on a list, um, and I can let you know when my book, my book is out. It'll be a book about all five of my apprenticeships, so, in English. And Japanese. No, it'll just be in English. <laughs> I'll look for a Japanese publisher after I get it out in English. Oh, yes, and you have to do the surveys. Yeah. So come on up and uh, finger these uh, attractions. I'll get something to drink.